You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Tell him you won't tailgate. Hammer! Oh, I won't ever. Do you know how many fucking car lengths it takes to stop a car at 35 miles an hour? Six fucking car lengths. That's 106 fucking feet, mister. If I had to stop suddenly, you would have hit me. I want you to get a fucking driver's manual. I want you to study that motherfucker. And I want you to pay the goddamn rules. 15 fucking thousand people were killed on the highway last year because of fucking assholes like you. Oh, tell me you're going to get a manual. I could get a manual. Fucking hate. Oh, 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 God. <laughs> Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Did you enjoy the audio bumper? That was my guest scene with Robert Loggia from Lost Highway, directed by David Lynch. We'll be obviously discussing that in this episode. Real quick, we're now at 400 subscribers just on Podbean. That's not total, but just on our host Podbean. I'm always trying to improve this podcast, so please share the podcast on social media. Share it with someone you know that can benefit from it. It will help us all out when you share it. Speaking of which, if you could do me a quick favor and tweet at Podern Family uh, on Twitter that I that this show should be their podcast of the week. It will be put into the uh, ballot and you'll be able to vote on it. I will link that in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. But again, that's at Podern Family and hopefully I can become a podcast of the week. Uh, real quick, our friends over at New York Cinema Festival and Hollywood Cinema Festival have offered us a discount for listeners of this show. So if you want to submit to the New York Cinema Festival, use code DBCAST25. If you want to submit to the Hollywood Cinema festival use code uh d db cast sorry it took me for a second there but i'm going to link to all the in the show notes everybody because again if you go to davebullis.com i have everything all linked everything spelled out it's very easy to follow uh i also want to ask is todd matthews the only person to listen to every episode of this podcast if you've listened to every episode of this podcast besides todd please let me know i'm very interested in knowing it i also want to give a shout out to my friend jason buff at Indie Film Academy. He is wrapping up right now on his short film, and uh, you know maybe I'll have him back on if he wants to come on to talk about it. Real, also, I just entered the Bruce Lee photo contest on Instagram. For those of you following me on Instagram, I've been putting up a new entry every single day. Uh, you know, just using this toy Bruce Lee figure and trying to pose him in different ways. Hopefully I win. I doubt I will because I'm up against some pretty stiff competition, but I'll link to that also in the show notes. And on this week's episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast, my guest has worked with some of the best directors ever, including David Lynch, Paul Verhoeven, and Milos Forman. My latest guest, uh, his latest movie, excuse me, is which, in which he directed, uh, was actually shot in 1984, and it's finally being released now. Think about that. He started filming this when I was born. It just shows you have to be in the long haul. It really does. And that movie, Dark Seductions, will be out October 11th on VOD and MOD. This is episode 130 with guest Greg Travis. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, buddy. My pleasure, Dave. My pleasure. Anytime I can talk to a fellow filmmaker, I'm down. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I appreciate it, Greg. Uh, you know, I looked at your IMDb. Well, actually, I knew of you before I looked at, at your IMDb uh-huh. uh, because I, I recognize you from a couple of different roles. And, you know, before I, I start talking about that and we, we get in all of your, you know, your your very lengthy IMDb with some very impressive credits, mm. my I just want to start off by asking about your background. And that is, I just want to ask, how did you get started in the film industry? You know, did you always want to act as when you were a kid? Uh, you know, it, so it's pretty much, I just want to know is, you know, how did you get started? Well, I was in, in high school. I got a Super 8 camera. I uh, started using my dad's home movie camera, and then I got one of the, the uh, sound cameras. And so I started making these little short Super 8 films my junior year, and then my high school year, I actually made a feature-length uh, Super 8 movie called Joe Dynamite, and I showed it at the uh, the high school theater, and uh, I was able to uh, get the theater for free and, uh, you know, work things out to where I actually made my money back and actually made a little profit on the whole venture. And I thought, wow, this is easy. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know what I was in for, um, you know, then I came out to Hollywood and went to film school. And while I was going to film school, I started auditioning at the comedy clubs and then uh, kind of got a stand up career going and um, got a few TV shows and started working the clubs. And, uh, and I did that for about 20 years. And then I moved into the acting direction in the mid 90s and got a few big movies. And then that kind of helped launch my acting career and did about 45 films in the, the last uh, 15 years or so. And um, now I'm on my third act and trying to get back to what I originally wanted to do here, which was be a director and a filmmaker. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've written all these years and I've made a lot of shorts all these years, but in the last uh, eight or nine years, I've really tried to focus in and, you know, make some movies. So I've got three features, Night Creep, Midlife, and now Dark Seduction that are finished features and that are getting out there. And Dark Seduction is being released uh, October 11th on VOD, North America VOD and pay-per-view. And so um, I'm super excited about that because it took me uh, about 30 years to complete that movie. (laughs) <laughs> Which I'm not yeah. bragging about. It's kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you, because it should have been finished, you know, at least 20 years ago. But uh, I ran up into I ran into a lot of obstacles and a lot of problems uh, with this particular film that uh, you know stopped me from finishing it. Every time I would go back to try to finish it, something horrific would happen and just stop me in my tracks or. Or sometimes I'd run out of money and I'd have to, you know, regroup, you know. So it seemed to be an ongoing uh, pattern in the uh, process of the whole post-production thing. But, uh, you know, uh, it's one of those things. You just, uh, you know, you try what you can. And then uh, when I got back to it the final time, I was able to get everything back and, uh, and finally finish it up. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, you know, Greg, I, I understand completely where you're coming from about projects, you know, stalling out and and having issues. Uh, you know, I, I've been there before. Uh, you know, whether you know it's it's you know different you know personalities, uh, you know, not agreeing on set or different producers, you know, not agreeing, uh, you know, or, or even you know sometimes. I mean, for instance, Greg, I had a, I one time I had an editor who. Uh, Every time I asked to see a cut of the movie, he would say, "Oh yeah, you know, it's do- going well, you know, this or that." And I'd say, "Well, I'm gonna go. I want to come up and see a cut of it." And he would always have an excuse. Oh, and yeah. finally, he, he, you know, he have to admit, he's like, "Listen, I, I have been working on it at all. I'm, I'm gonna." And he's like, "You know, I'm sorry." Oh, he goes, I, "I, yeah." So yeah. I, I, I understand completely what you mean. But you know, I, I do want to talk more about Dark Seduction. Um, but mm. you know, I, I would be, you know, I, I again, you have such an extensive IMDb resume. I just want to sort of take a step back and, and okay. talk about some of your credits. I mean, you have worked with some of the best directors, you know, not only going today, but some of the directors that have, you know, ever, ever lived. I mean, you've worked with David Lynch, Paul Verhoeven. Uh, you've worked with Bobcat Goldthwait. You've Bob worked Raffleson, with Ad- uh, who yeah. did Five Easy Pieces, a lot of Jack Nicholson films. 
Yeah, that was yeah. a thrill to work with him and uh, Milos Forman, uh, who did the uh, the Andy Kaufman movie, uh, Man on the Moon. And um, yeah, I I was lucky in the fact that of being a filmmaker and an actor, I had studied films all of my life and was a huge movie goer when I was a kid. So I had seen just about everything any all these guys had done, especially when it came out on video. I rented everything and my friend in New York had a video store so I could watch anything that was available and so um, you know I've always studied film and uh, always loved it and so it, when I would meet these directors and go in for the final audition I would start talking to them about their obscure movie the, the one movie that no one knew about that's the one I would talk to them about <laughs> and they, they love that you know they absolutely love that because like they don't get a chance to discuss it so was like you know kind of the inside scoop on some of their obscure films i would like talk to them about you know but david was great i didn't really have too much to say he was in the middle of shooting and the casting director brought me over to him and you know he just said great you're right this is great you look great and it'll be perfect and so that was about it so you know i got lucky on that one and he was a whole lot of fun to work with he's really detailed oriented he put the blood on my face himself and he um you know he was like uh really had ideas about every little movement and every little thing I and mean, it was all very well planned out and very well thought out you know he knew what he wanted and uh or you know you never know exactly what you want i mean you got an idea a concept of the scene and how it should go and you try to explain it to the actors and then you just hope for the best and that's basically what every director does and then you tweak it as you go along you say well maybe you don't you know, you don't scream it that much here. Maybe you bring it down a little bit there. Or maybe you don't hit him with the gun there. You know, that kind of thing, you know. So, uh, but, um, yeah, I'd always been a, a – as a matter of fact, uh, Eraserhead was uh, kind of the first midnight movie that I saw when I came out here. And um, it, it just disturbed disturbed me to no end. I just didn't quite understand it. and But I felt, I mean, I felt it. I felt there was something really going on here, but I didn't quite, you know, I didn't understand what was happening. But it uh, it moved me. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> you know, it's funny because I took somebody to see Lost Highway mm -hmm. and, and he had never seen it before. And when he, he left the theater, he goes, you know, Dave, he goes, that movie, I, I, I'm not sure what was happening, but he goes, I, I'm very interested. And he, he said, you know, a couple of days later on, he texted me and he goes, you know, I'm still thinking about Lost Highway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I had some really fun stuff in it and some really creepy stuff, too, you know. Um, I always thought as if it is a, a revenge dream, uh, you know, by the... Bill Pullman character, and, uh, you know, that's sort of, I think, what it was. Uh, you know, he becomes this young guy in his dream and gets revenge on the, the older guys who messed him up with his girlfriend, you know, or his wife. So at least that's kind of the way I take it. And then he did that same sort of thing in... Um, in his next movie that was going to be the TV show that got so many awards, um, uh, what the hell's the name of it? Oh, Mahal Mahal Drive. Drive, yeah. He did the same kind of thing, only with women. It was the same sort of like switching characters and, uh, you know, becoming another person kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's funny because you know, now he, you know, when we saw him, uh, when when he, he, you know, he was actually there and he introduced Twin, uh, or sorry, he introduced Lost Highway, and he said, and people were asked, you know, are you working on anything else? And he said no. And then about a couple of days later, he announces that he's back with uh, Twin Peaks season three on Showtime. Oh really? And, uh, yeah, it was just. Uh, I was like, wow. If he had only, you know, but uh, but it was just amazing. You know, I, I've uh, just a funny little story, real quick. I actually tried to get him on for 100th episode mm -hmm. of this podcast, and I actually missed him by a couple of, I guess maybe a couple of days. His his manager actually said that he's off shooting uh, uh, season three of Twin Peaks, and he's like, you know, it's all he's doing right now. So uh, maybe when yeah. he comes back. But I was like, you know, I mean, that guy. I mean, he's just you know phenomenal. Uh, I mean, but you know, so I wanted, I wanted to ask Greg is, you know, when you're working with somebody, you know, like Lynch, or you're working with somebody like Paul Verhoeven, you know, 
what are some of the biggest takeaways that you think you've had? Is, is, do you think there's something that there's there's like one constant that uh, you know sort of uh, maybe a strength that all these directors share that makes them you know who they are? Well, they all have a kind of a def- definite look that they're trying to achieve with the film itself, the way they shoot it, the way they you know are going to cut it. Um, the the hardest thing I think for any director is to get a mood, a certain type of tone that can carry through the throughout the film. I think David Lynch, that's one of his strengths. He really knows how to set a tone, a dark, ominous kind of creepy tone to the thing, and keep that. You know, I mean, it's not constantly throughout the film, but it's still there, and. Um, Boy, he's really great at that, and and every other director has their strength. Like Verhoeven is a kind of a very strong, just in your face imagery that just really sticks with you and really hits you in the chest. You know, very entertaining, very fun, and uh, and just keeps coming at you. You know, and I love that kind of stuff. I love you know strong imagery and strong choices, and. Um, you know, as an actor, when you work with these kind of guys, you just have to kind of like go with your confidence and come in with the strongest ideas that you can think of and just, you know, know that that's right and not worry about exactly what you think they want. But within the script and what what you think it it needs, that's what you give them. And they'll let you know if it's not what they want or if they want to tweak it. But most of the time they really liked what I did and uh, they were very happy with it. So I was really lucky to to be able to work with those guys, you know. Yeah, you know, Greg, that was actually one going to be my next question was, you know, as an actor, you know, you know, what what is sort of like, you know, what you're you're bringing, you know, obviously you're bringing, you know, your own unique skills and talents to the role and you know, they you know, they're they're directing you obviously in this in this particular role. And so one of my question was is what are some of the biggest takeaways that they, that they when you're working with them that that you have used in your own projects? You know, uh, sort of like something that you've learned from, you know, uh, Zack Snyder or Verhoeven, you know that, or even Rob Zombie, you know something that you've mm-hmm. taken and sort of put into your own films. Um, they all do different things. Like Zack Snyder does various speed takes where he'll do a, a shot, you know, twenty times, and he'll do it a little bit differently each time. And I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, I haven't been able to use that exactly, but. I like the idea of doing it a little different each time instead of trying to do it the same way each time. He does it a little differently each time. And I think um, I've heard that uh, Ridley Scott does that same kind of thing. He'll move the camera an inch or two over with each progressive take so that he gets a little bit different angle and a little bit different look, you know. And um, I thought that's pretty, pretty cool. Um you know the the film the last film that i you know shot and put out there was midlife which was a very cassavetes type of a look i shot it long lens and then the wide shots were like a 40 millimeter so it was kind of a wide and that's what i was going for was a very tight kind of very realistic cassavetes type of look and so uh, that's kind of what I was trying to capture and so I would go back and study all of his films and and see what he was doing exactly and they're all a little different and they're all shot a little different there is no one Cassavetti's look but he does do long lens close-ups and pretty tight close-ups when he does them and so I use that technique and uh You know, you just learn, you just pick up different directorial techniques from working with all these different directors, and then also what, you know, working as a director for many, many, many short films and theater and all kinds of different things, and my own shows and stand up. Because in stand up, you're really directing yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you're really sort of like jumping out of your skin and saying, well, what would this look like and what would that look like? And you kind of have to have a second nature about what would make an audience laugh or what would make an audience cry. And you develop those skills as you go along. And I think that I've been able to do that. And now I'm ready to really apply all that knowledge to making movies, you know. 
Yeah, you know, and that, that's a good point, Greg. And, you know, that's what actually what I wanted to sort of segue into right now was, uh, you know, just looking at your IMDb page, you know, you've uh, you've written uh, five pieces and, you know, you've directed four. And I just want to ask, you know, the your first, you know, IMDb credit, you know, uh, uh, that you have is Night Creep. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask, you know, you, you made this in 2003. It was also written by you. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask, Greg, you, know, you, you said in the intro that you, you, know, you sort of want to go back to this because this, this is why you, you got into this was you, yep. know, you wanted to make your own films. Right. So w- was, it, was it the right sort of time and place, so to speak, to make Night Creep? What, what I mean by that is did you just sort of have the, the, like a, sort of like a small window or maybe an opportunity at that point in time? Yeah, you said I had I'd, I'd hooked up with this, you know, this guy who was going to invest in it and he was going to you know, put up the money. And so um, I, I wrote a pretty – I wrote a script that was pr- – what I thought was pretty commercial. And um, actually it wasn't very commercial at all. <laughs> but I w- it kind of wrote a psychological horror film in a very kind of Lynchian, David Lynchian kind of way to where we don't really know what's going on half the movie and we're waiting to find out. But at least in my movie, I do let the cat out of the bag at the end of the film and I do explain somewhat what was happening, even though there's a few things left up in the air, as opposed to David Lynch, who doesn't ever explain anything. <laughs> and, and you're just like left walking out of the theater and what the fuck was that all about? But, um, you know, you have to study his films and then, you know, kind of come to some conclusions on your own. But that's what makes him fun, you know. But, um, yeah, I just had I had a window of opportunity, and then of course that investor pulled out at the last minute, and then I had to scurry around with some of my own money and so a few other people that I knew put a little money into it, and then we were able to kind of pull it together and do it. But uh, you know, I had made Dark Seduction back in the mid '80s, and uh, I actually felt really, really confident at that time because I'd been doing a lot of shorts leading up to that. And I had a very specific look, and the partner that that I was working with shot it, and he understood what we were going for. And so the look of Dark Seduction, I was pretty much satisfied with. I mean, there's a lot you could go back and say, well, I could have done this, I could have done that. But I, for the most part, I got what I was trying to get, you know. And um, there's always things you could have done better. And some of the shots we did were out of focus and didn't come out, which was a shame. But you just, you know, you work with what you got. And um, and so then all of that time, I would go, you know, be thinking that I was going to come back and finish Dark Seduction. And then after that, that would lead to another film. So when I made Night Creep, I had just gotten to the place where I just had to do something else. And I couldn't depend on, you know, finishing Dark Seduction for that one. I just had to, you know, start from scratch and do something new. And so uh, it has some of the similar themes running through it. There's some lesbianism and there's some, you know, kind of like creepiness that's similar to Dark Seduction in a way. But uh, it's not about vampires or anything. It's about a creepy landlord that uh, comes into this girl's room at night while she's sleeping. And we don't know if it's a dream or if it's reality or exactly what's going on. Because she takes a drug and so we think the night creep drug might be causing her to have these hallucinations. And so that's part of the plot. But uh, it came out pretty good. It's a lot of fun, you know. And um, But Dark Seduction is the one that really everybody seems to be responding to. Uh, the premiere was a huge success, and the audience loved it. And um, everybody's really... Uh, really uh, excited about it and uh, you know they really really like it so it's kind of a weird hybrid of a 1940s detective film and an 80s lesbian vampire film and uh, we're not sure if the vampires are really vampires or if they're just badass chicks that think they're vampires and go around doing these things and so there's that mystery and there's that angle of it and uh, you know, it's just a really odd, kind of weird little cool cult movie that, uh, you know, took me forever to finish. But I'm glad I did because the technology has gotten so much.
much better now. It made it so much. It's now it's much slicker, and the sound and the music and everything about it is m- much better now. Having finished it this past year, than it would have been if I would have finished it 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You know. Yeah, you know, Greg, that was actually what I was going to ask you also was, you know, since you started making that in the 80s, uh, you know, like you said, you started that in the 80s, you know, the camera technology has, you know, just, you know, gone through so many evolutions, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, now you can you can go out now and, you know, our, our phone is a camera. Yeah. And now also, you know, you know, there's cameras out that cost as much as a house, you know, yeah. and uh, you know, it's, it's amazing this, this amount of technology. So I wanted to ask, you know, did you did you, you know, use any of the of the new camera sections as sort of put maybe shoot some new scenes or no shoot any no i shot there? everything everything we shot i did in uh 84 85 uh on 16 millimeter black and white and when i did a 2k transfer from the negative um it really really i mean it's a little grainy i mean it's you know it's grainy in certain areas but it really looks fantastic um the 2K transfer just brought out all the imagery and brought out all the little details, and uh, I couldn't have asked for a better quality, you know, print of it. Uh, it it's much better than if I'd have made a film print because uh, we have more control with the digital transfer, you know, mm. and it is sharper than a film print. I mean, it is a little bit sharper. So I got everything, you know, and if, unfortunately the, the negative had been sitting around for a long time. So there, even though they cleaned it a couple of times and we had it sonically cleaned, there's still a little dust here and there that was embedded in the negative. So, you know, it gives it kind of an old, you know, TCM, you know, a little bit of an old quality that, you know, kind of makes it even cooler, you know. I mean, nobody's yeah. ever complained about the little specks that are on a few of the scenes or, you know, that pop up from time to time, but uh, it kind of gives it an old feel to it, which is kind of neat, too, you know. Yeah, you know, Greg, when I, I think I, I, I either I saw a still or I, I believe I watched a trailer also, it kind of reminds me of Dark City in a way, because uh, you said it was like a 1940s you know, detective uh-huh. mixed with the 1980s. It reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Dark City, but it, in a way it reminds me it, it, a little bit of that film. Was that a color and, film, uh, though? Was Dark City a color, like the Canadian yeah. film? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think Val Kilmer, or no, probably wasn't Val Kilmer. I'm, I'm but I'm. Uh, I forget actually who was in it. Was it Elias Mateus? That. And it was in a lot of strip joint scenes. He was like a bouncer in a strip joint or something. Was that the one you're talking about? Dark City. Yeah, it was by. It was directed by Alex Pro, Pro, Provius. I think it's pronounced. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And it was. I don't uh, know. There, there might be one I'm confusing it with, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's definitely a dark noir, you know, and uh, uh, that's kind of what I'm going for with this, uh, you know, that that '40s noir that like had the tough, you know, square jaw detective that was drinking and smoking all the way through the film, like kind of a Bogart type character, but a little bit more, a little bit more tougher and bigger, and uh, you know, able to take a little bit more punishment than even Bogart. So. I found this actor comedian named Tyler Horn who was perfect for the role and so I just I didn't even have a casting session I just asked him if he wanted to do it cuz I knew he'd be great in it and uh he really is funny he's uh he's quite a a perfect uh, kind of Dick Tracy looking uh character so it worked out really well so, Greg, you know, coming from an acting background, do you, do you feel that, you know, that was sort of like sort of like your unfair advantage or, because that was your biggest strength? Because, you you know, you've worked with all these directors. You also yourself are an, is an, are, are an actor. Mm-hmm. So you're able to sort of, you know, talk to these actors. Maybe you understand them in a different way that maybe most directors don't, if you know, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you know, part of it is the casting of the actor. And then, uh, you know, sometimes you get into a situation where – you know, you've got really good improv actors, and you would be an idiot not to let them improvise. And some directors are not, you know, savvy to that. They they want to stick to the script per verbatim, and they don't know when to expand their idea and to take advantage of a talented improvise a talented actor who can improvise. And even if you don't use it in the film, sometimes you just go. You just let it happen, and you, like, play with the ideas. And um, 
I think improvisation is a really good technique because you've got the idea and the script. You know where you're going with it. You know, let them play with the lines a little bit. As long as the information you need to drive the plot is in there, then you can, like, you know, you can go off script a little bit and play with the ideas. And you never know. You might just use one of those lines in the editing, or you might use a couple little of those bits. And a lot of times it's better than what you had in mind in the script, because you can't always imagine it until you get there. And then when you get there and you see what you've got to work with, go ahead and work with it. Go ahead and expand the idea, you know? And uh, explore it a little bit. I mean, um, I think that's the key to really good filmmaking is to explore the ideas once you get there, you know. Yeah, I, I concur, Greg. Uh, you know, the, the more I study and the more I, you know, I, I apply these things, the more I find, especially in my writing, uh, you know, the more you you expand and explore and stay curious about these ideas. Yeah. You know, the more they're able to flow. Yeah, and um, it's it's. You know, it's tricky because I did a lot of improv in midlife, and the first cut of it was like two and a half hours long, and I thought, you know, that was a pretty good cut, but I was wrong. I ended up taking like 40 minutes out of it and uh, kept whittling it down until I got it where it was at its basic essence, and it was just what I needed, but not too much. It was just enough to tell the story, and that's what you try to go for is just the essence of what you need to tell the story, you know. Um, people like, you know, there's a lot of directors who get a little indulgent and, um, I think the big trick is not to let the line of tension go. Um, you know, that's the most important thing in a film. If you look at all the classics and all the Orson Welles films, he was very adamant about keeping the line of tension in there, you know? which is driving the story and also keeping the audience interested as to what's going to happen at the end of this story, what's going to happen to these characters, you know. But when you lose that and you veer off and you go into different places for a long period of time that don't have anything to do with the story, it can really derail the train, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it can really throw you off and can throw your audience off. So you really have to keep that in mind. The line of tension, I think, is the most important thing, you know. Whether it's a yeah, comedy I, or a drama or whatever kind of movie you're making, you really want to keep the audience interested in what's going to happen at the end, you know? Yeah, I was listening to an art, uh, uh, interview by Lawrence Block, who uh, who did uh, A Walk Among the Tombstones. Uh, he wrote that, and he was uh, you know saying the same thing about you know having that tension in there because you don't want audiences going in going, well, hey, I know this guy's not going to die because you know uh, you know or so of because of you know X Y and Z, and I know this thing's going to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's where you know I think a lot of people sort of you know because people who usually you know go to movies you know they they've seen other movies before in the same genre. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They've seen you know action movies that's why when a diehard comes around it just blows people out of the water because they're going holy crap you know this is this guy's this John McClane he's bleeding he doesn't know what's going on he's injured he he doesn't you know he's not just walking in the room with a machine gun clearing out the whole room right uh you know they really he really had to you know dissect what was going on and do this sort of very very uh you know uh cerebrally uh, that's even a word cerebrally but you know he had to go in there and, and you know sort of deduce you know and sort of use a surgeon scalpel and then you know that's why i think you know die hard is such a you know a, a a unique movie of its own right yeah yeah absolutely i mean when it came out it was just uh he was outnumbered and the situation the conflict of the situation was fresh and new uh you know we hadn't seen anything like that you know in a building where you're stuck in the crawl spaces and you've got to maneuver your way and try to find a way to get rid of these guys and uh yeah, it was a great little uh, scripted piece, you know, and it, it was very well executed on the direction, too, because the the other cops didn't know what was going on, and they weren't taking it seriously, and, and you know, these guys were, we knew as an audience member, these guys are super bad, and you better take them seriously, or you're going to get, you're in for a big surprise, and so we knew that as an audience, but, you know, within the film, they didn't know that, and so that was kind yeah. of an interesting uh, angle on it as well, and there's also those kinds of things as an audience, you tell the audience certain things, but the characters don't know. Like in Dark Seduction, we know as an audience how he got bit, 
but he doesn't figure it out until well into the film, you know, because he just can't remember and it's not clear to him and he's not sure what's going on and you know. But it's a comedy. I mean, it's a it's more of a comedy parody of a 1940s detective film than it is anything else but I tried to make it its own unique movie by combining it with an 80s vampire feel so it's like a time shift if that makes any sense there's like two different time periods going on at the same time so it's kind of weird that way you know well, you know, Greg, you know, as we talk about dark, dark seduction, uh, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, your writing style, you know, and your mm-hmm. writing process, you know, so when you're going to sit down and, you know, whether you use a notebook or whether you, you know, write this on a computer, I wanted to ask, you know, what is, what is your process? I mean, do you sort of already, you know, have, you know, I'm sure you already have an idea in mind, mm-hmm. but do you outline it heavily or do you just, you know, sort of let it flow naturally? Yeah, when I'm writing a feature, I do a three act outline and I try to outline each scene uh, with a number and I go through the whole thing and try to get an outline because when you're in, when you're scripting it if you can at least put a few lines of dialogue in that paragraph that you've outlined that scene with it gives you a jumping off place and you know where you're going next and then of course you change things as you go along and not all outlines not all scenes in the outline are going to make it into the script and then you come up with new stuff as you go along too Um, but at least it gives you sort of a place to start with and uh, I just wrote a little short film and I just kind of you know did it in a week and just kind of chipped away at it like a page, page and a half a day until I got it all done, like, you know, 13, 14 pages. And then uh, I sent it to some few people, got some feedback, did another draft of it, and now I think it's in pretty good shape. And so um, I think, you know, you think about these things for a while, you kind of like get a beginning, a middle, and an end, and think about, you know, okay, you need this scene, you need that scene. And I didn't outline that particular short film. I just actually just scripted it from just what I had in mind. So it's a little different with each project, but uh, I think on a full feature, it's really good to uh, do a detailed outline of the whole thing first. And I learned that from uh, working with, uh, I used to write with uh, Rick Overton. We were writing partners uh, back in the 80s. We wrote some scripts for studios and a bunch of uh, screenplays for independence and whatnot. And uh, I learned that technique from um, James Keach and Brian Grazer, who were the producers we were working with in the early days. And so uh, that's one of the things they liked to do. And um, I think it works pretty well, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's worked pretty well for uh, especially Brian Grazer, right? Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Well, it just gives you an overview of the movie. It's like, oh, okay, now I can kind of see what kind of movie we're you know we're trying to do here. Before you write the script, you kind of have an idea of how it's all going to go down. And a lot of a lot of writers say they just jump right into it and they just write, 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 and they don't even worry about the three act structure. But um, their scripts definitely fall short and kind of fall flat because of that. I've read a ton of scripts, and uh, you know, if you don't have that three act structure in there, it's it really can be quite problematic. You know, not that it, everything has to have that or that it should have that. I mean, with midlife, the three act structure was sort of hidden, and it was not exactly the way it should be, um, but it was still there. You know, it was still there, and um, I think that's a good thing to have consciously when you approach an idea because if it's not there you're really on shaky ground you're on shaky territory and by that three act structure I mean like certain things have to happen to your lead character you know certain beats and certain things obstacles and the conflict has to increase and you know all those types of things that are script structure you know yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's something I've talked to before, especially with Alan Watt from LA Raiders Lab. You know, we talked about, you know, what the three act structure is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even, even the different systems that you've seen, like Save the Cat, you know, really what they're trying to do is, it, it, you know, not only is it trying to guide a transformation, but it's also, you know, trying to just make sure that you're always amping it up. Yeah. So that way, you know, you don't sort of, you know, a, on page 15, you know, you have some kind of climax and the rest of the movie, you're just sort of, you know, just meandering. It's sort of, right. you know, just trying to give you like a blueprint of where to go. Right. And he's an expert 
expert at that much more than I am, but the uh, the upping the ante on the conflict is an important element to keep in there so that the uh, the stakes get higher as you go along, you know. So that, Absolutely. Yeah. And and that can apply to any kind of story, you know, whether you're doing something about a little kid or, you know, whatever it is, the stakes keep getting higher and the conflict keeps getting more and more intense, you know. So that's what keeps the line of tension in place and keeps the audience wondering, what's going to happen next? Oh, my God, you know. It can't get any worse, you know, especially in horror movies. That's a very uh, prevalent technique uh, to use, you know, when the girl's trapped in a castle and she just keeps one bad thing happens after another. And, you know, what's, you know, what's the next bad thing that's going to happen? You know, it's like a horrific thing that's going to happen. It just keeps getting worse and worse. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, you know, knowing uh, all of this, you know, and learning all of these things throughout the years as both a writer, actor, and a filmmaker is just gives you more ammunition, gives you more uh, confidence going into a project. And, uh, you know, films are tricky propositions, you know. They're just not a guarantee that they're going to work, even if you have a good script, even if you you know, have just thought about it and you've got it all worked out and you shoot it perfectly. I mean, when people went to see The Shining, they were walking out on it. They didn't like it. You know, it wasn't like the book. Everybody was expecting, you know, Stanley to do the book and he didn't. And uh, it just kind of, you know, it didn't really shock you or scare you that much. It had a few scares in it, but not really that scary. But it took years for that film to sort of find its audience and find its place in the horror world. And now it's considered to be one of the best horror movies ever made. But believe me, when it came out in 1980, nobody knew what to make of it. They were just like, oh, that was weird, you know. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't know how great it was, in other words, what I'm trying to say. And a lot of his movies are like that. They they take time to kind of... uh, find their audience and to kind of uh, become, you know, as great as they really are. But uh, I don't know how he was able to do that, but somehow he did what he was. Films are weird. I mean, you don't always get it the first viewing, you know. And then there's all different ways. If you view something by yourself on television, it doesn't always hit you. But when you see it with an audience in a theater, oh, my God, it becomes a whole different thing, you know. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean yeah. with with that because uh, you know I've had that, that that happen to me with uh, certain movies. You know, it's sort of like the shared the shared experience in a theater, and then I, you know you you try to watch it at home later on. You're like it didn't hit the same way, or even vice versa. You know, it's just it really it's very interesting. It's just, and even David Lynch had said something about this. He said, you know, don't watch movies on your phone. Yeah, he goes, I don't know why people are trying to watch movies on their phone. Yeah, I mean it's it's. Uh... It, it, it's a certain mood, it's a certain excitement that goes along with seeing it on the big screen. You can see everything that the movie has to offer on the big screen, and it's the shared experience that makes it much more elevated and much more of an experience altogether. And uh, yeah, I was real tickled being able to show some of my films to a full packed theater and see the true reactions. And it's amazing, you know, some of the things that I've seen a thousand times and didn't think were that funny get big laughs and you're just going what was that all about i i didn't think that would get a laugh but it it does you just never know you just never know about you know certain things yeah. in your own movie that you think you don't even think about them you know and then all of a sudden people are reacting to it and it's just amazing you know it just it's, it's constantly surprising yeah, you know, very true. You know, it, it's you know, it's so, a lot of these things are come, become very subjective. You know, yeah. they they sort of you know, some things hit, some things don't later on, and then vice versa in a different well, screening. Well, that's the problem with sending your movie to a distributor online on a file. Is like, you know, well, how is this guy going to watch this thing? Is he going to watch it while he's you know on his laptop on the bus on the way home? Is he going to watch it on his phone, or is he going to put it on the big screen when he gets home and sit back with some friends and watch it? You know, I mean. I mean, they say they, you know, they. I don't think anybody can really watch a film by themselves on a small device and really 
have a good response to it. You know, nothing looks as good on a small device by yourself. I don't care who you are, you know. You're not going to respond to it as much as if you said it with a few other people because you're you're focusing more on the movie or watching the movie with other people in the room than you are by yourself. You get distracted, you put it down, you stop it for a while. That's not the way a movie's supposed to be. It's a book. It's a it's a one thing. It's a one time. You got to go from A to Z with it. You know. Yeah. 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 And I want to ask, you know, uh, since the, you know, your movie Dark Section comes out this, uh, today as, you know, this podcast is being released, you know, uh, Greg, where can people find Dark Seduction at? It is going to be on pay per view. Um, movie on demand. You can order the DVD on Amazon. I think it's going to be on iTunes and all of the pay-per-view cable outlets in North America. And um, and just uh, you know, look it up online. Uh, Dark Seduction pay-per-view or Dark Seduction VOD video on demand in your area. So it's going to be on cable outlets and. Uh, video on demand outlets, and that's about all I can tell you. I mean, it's going to be on so many of them. I, I don't know all the listings, you know, but uh, it should be available, you know, Amazon, iTunes, um, and all the uh, cable pay per views. So we'll we'll should be able to find it pretty easily. And uh, for everyone listening, I'm going to make sure to link to that in the show notes uh, as soon as I can find a, you know, the, uh, where I can send, sure to send you to, like maybe even Amazon or mm-hmm. even Xbox or all of them. Mm-hmm. So that way, I'll, I'll so I'll put a few links in the show notes. Okay. Uh, you know, Greg, uh, Greg, you know, as, as we're talking, uh, I, I have some uh, Twitter questions that came in. Would you mind answering one or two not before we finish, not finish at all. up? Yeah. Uh, my first question is: What do you recommend uh, for a first-time filmmaker in directing actors? That seems to be a tough thing. I think a first-time director might do himself a big favor by maybe taking an acting class. Um, Guys that are coming more from a script or an editing position and then moving up to directing their own things might... um, might consider taking an acting class just to get an idea of watching the teacher direct actors and watching the actors work out a scene and rehearse a scene and how it's all supposed to go down because uh, in actuality there's a camera rehearsal with the actors rehearsal Uh, sometimes there's a couple of actors rehearsals before the camera comes in so that you can kind of find the choreography and find the way you want to do it and then the camera guy comes in and starts seeing how he can shoot the scene along with the actors rehearsing it and then you break for makeup and touch-ups and whatever else you need to do and then you come back and you're ready to go and then you shoot it but um you know, uh, reading books about acting, and it, it, it's a little overcomplicated. I mean, there's this whole methodology that, you know, there's different branches of the method, and all of that is well and good, but that's usually the actor's responsibility to take that on and learn that and use that as his own technique and part of his craft to get where he needs to be for an imaginary scene, you know. And so directing actors in that you know if they need a little time to cry if they need a little time to get into a certain headspace an intensity or something you give them that time as long as it's not too long a time uh you give them a little you know a minute or so to to do what they need to do to get there and you're better served um sometimes that's what it is sometimes um Sometimes actors are, you know, in character, and they stay in character, and so there's that to consider. Um, Sometimes they're in a certain mood that will help them create the character and the mood that they're trying to achieve, and so you can't, uh, you kind of have to kind of watch out for that sometimes, and... You know, and then some actors, you know, just drop it the minute the you all cut and they're themselves again, and then they jump back into character, you know, when the cameras roll. So there's all kinds of different ways that actors approach it. And uh, you just have to be aware of all of that as a director. 
But basically, you know, you've got to know when somebody hits a sour note and if the line reading is not very good, uh, you, you really have to be able to tell that and tell the actor how you want to adjust it. Not doing a line reading for the actor, but go, let's try that a little quicker or try it a little different way. It just seemed kind of falling. It didn't sound real or, you know, something to that nature where they, you know, they get an idea, but you're not insulting them at the same time because you want to be really nice to your actors. You don't want to be mean to them at all because then they get upset and they get nervous and they, they don't perform as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, just one, one thing that someone once told me, too, it really helped me out when I was, you know, making my my student film was, uh, and it's something you touched on, uh, Greg, which it, it reminded me of was trying things a little bit differently. And it's sort of what he, what he his mistake was, the guy giving me advice was when he made a student film, he would do every take exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. So every actor, every performance was the exact same way, lighting, same way, camera, same way. Well, finally, he realized, wait a minute, I really all my takes are pretty much the same. <laughs> so, you know, take take, you know, take one A, you know, take one is the same as take 10. Yeah. So it really, at the end of the day, he said, you know, I, what I should have done was uh, after each take, I should have just tweaked that performance, make that adjustment, uh, you know, and just sort of try everything a different way, so to speak, to sort of try to find the best sort of way to handle that scene. Well, I mean, you're going for something very specific. I mean, that's the thing. It's like I'm a character, like I just did this little horror movie called The the Bornless Ones. It's, uh, I think it's it's coming out later in October or whatever, but uh, I saw it at a festival a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know, if I'm a creepy guy at a gas station, which I play in this film, um, there's just so much leeway on each line that I've got to work with. I'm going for a specific kind of insulting, kind of creepy, kind of hardcore feeling with this character. So I don't have a lot of latitude. I'm really trying to pinpoint that feeling and that that character, you know? And I think that's kind of, unless you're a character that's all over the place, that's kind of what you're trying to do is, <clears throat> you know, pinpoint your reactions, pinpoint your, your, uh, your lines to define the character that you're playing to be that character and how that feels with that character and there is a right and wrong in that i do believe you know sometimes it feels more like the character and then you say it slow or you say it in a different way then it doesn't feel like the character and so that's what you're doing you're just trying to get that meter to as close to that character as possible you know yeah, and I think that's great advice. I think that's great advice, Greg. Uh, you know, Greg, uh, you know, just in, in closing, uh, you know, we've been talking for about, you know, f about 45 minutes now. So in closing, is there anything that maybe we didn't want to discuss that you want to sort of ta talk about? Or is there any sort of thing you want to sort of uh, – any p parting thoughts you have for us to sort of pour a, a period at the end of this whole conversation? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I've done a lot of different aspects of the business, and it's a very difficult business. I don't recommend it to anybody, but uh, – uh, I at the same time realized that film is a big thing, and I would say continue to support um, movies by going to the movies. Uh, maybe not so many, uh, you know, comic book blockbusters, but more independent cinema, because we still want to see movies in the theater, and we still want to support the theater showings of films. And, uh, you know, I would say don't pirate movies, don't download pirated films because that only hurts the filmmaker and it makes it much more difficult to put films out there um, you know everybody wants something for free on the internet but we still we got to get our money back and we've got to try to support the films that uh, that are made on a shoestring budget that are good uh, by paying a little you know four or five bucks to see them you know I don't think there's anything you know I think that's an honorable way to go and I think that's what we as film lovers, you know, should do. Uh, that's the right thing to do. And, um, you know, I'm hoping everybody will enjoy Dark Seduction. And I've got another film, Midlife, that's on iTunes and Indie Rain and uh, a few other outlets out there. And uh, check that out. But uh, Dark Seduction is the big one. And uh, 
it's you know it's very comic book it's very cultish it's very uh dark and moody but it's also extremely funny and uh i'm super proud of it and um it's kind of different it's it's unique it's got its own little thing going you know so i hope people uh dig it you know and I'll make sure to again, everyone. I'm going to link to that in the show notes as well, especially to you know Greg's films. Yeah. On, and there's uh, also iTunes. a Dark Seduction page on Facebook, and there's a Dark Seduction Twitter uh, on Twitter. So yeah, uh, the Facebook page is what I'm using now. Is uh, and my website is gtfilmproductions.com is my production company website. You, you read my mind, Greg. So I was going to next question. We're going to find you out online, and you're on Twitter too, right? Yes, yes. Greg the actor on Twitter, and then there's a dark under slash under slash seductions that's on Twitter as well. <clears throat> So, uh, Greg, Greg Travis, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. Uh, again, I always learn a lot from my guests, and you know, Greg, you've continued that that line of of, uh, of education, and I, you know, this has just been a phenomenal interview, especially because I don't get enough actors on. That's that's a case. Usually, you know, a lot of screenwriters, a lot of directors, a lot of producers, mm-hmm. I don't get more, enough actors on okay. here. Uh, every. Everybody, it's DaveBullis.com, where you can find all the show notes, and I will link to everything that Greg and I discussed in, in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. Greg Travis, I want to say thank you so much for coming on, and I wish you the best with Dark Seduction. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Oh, thank you, sir. And uh, if you ever feel like you want to come back on, I would love to have you on anytime. I really look forward to see what, you, what you're going to do in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.